Greetings everyone, welcome. Welcome back. I'm recording this video uh, in case I use this video in the future during the uh, 2020 coronavirus scare. And so apologies that I'm not don't have I'm not surrounded by books in my office, right? You know, but uh, you know we're making the best of it. So uh, making this video today to discuss Renaissance sonnets and poetry with you. And so just to, <clears throat> just to kick us off, you know, I, anytime that I teach this lesson, it's usually within the confines of a world literature course, maybe a British literature course, if I'm lucky enough to teach that. It's not too often I teach that one as an American lit scholar. But... Um, you know, all this stuff is pretty complicated. You know, usually when we get to this part of the course, we've read a lot of poetry already. You know, we've read epic poems from the likes of Milton and Palmer and Virgil. You know, we've read um, you know, medieval romances from the likes of Chaucer. You know, we, so, sometimes we'll read... Greek and Roman lyric poems like Sappho or Catullus. Um, but this stuff is re really different. You know, a Renaissance sonnet is a very particular type of form. So the two authors I want to talk about in this video, I'm going to make a separate video to talk about Shakespeare's sonnets in order to keep the um, in order to keep the flow going. You know, without making too long a video. And so um, let's just get straight to it and talk about our two authors that we're discussing, Petrarch and Sir Thomas Wyatt. I made a Google document for everyone. Um, I'll make it, you know, just typing out some notes. Make sure that I'm recording. Yeah, I will, I will make sure that you guys have a copy of these notes that I've typed out. But the poems of Petrarch. Petrarch lived from 1304 to 74. He was, he was born during Dante's lifetime. Dante was well into his adulthood by the time Petrarch was born. It was a bit of a generational difference, kind of like the baby boomers to the millennials. Petrarch is oftentimes responsible for what we now think of as the Renaissance. He was one of the first writers, along with Dante, you know, that kind of gave birth to this rediscovery of old ancient Greek, ancient Roman knowledge. Now, as far as the literary world goes, he was one of the first prominent figures. Of course, when we talk about the art world, well, we, the visual art world, you might think about somebody like Michelangelo, or Leonardo da Vinci. All this stuff started up in Italy around in the uh, four, early 14th century. And of course, uh, the English, I mentioned it below this, but the English you know, were slow to develop a renaissance. You know, it started up in the 1300s in in Italy, but it really didn't hit England until the 1500s. So it took a little while for culture to sort of spread over, you know, to to England in this way. You know, but uh, so a little bit about the man himself. You know, he. He fell in love with a lot of these uh, ancient Greek and Roman poets, you know, people like Virgil, Sappho, Catullus. Um, you know, what Petrarch, what Petrarch was a big fan of, you know, medieval romances. You know, he, it, I think I read somewhere where he had read Chaucer. You know, but, um, you know, Petrarch wanted to kind of go back, take a step back to the old. You know, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans did things right. And we kind of lost that 
you know, during those 13 century, or, well, not 13, about 10 centuries after the fall of Rome. And so he wanted to go back to that. So he helped pioneer a genre that we now call the sonnet. So the sonnet is, the word for it is little song. So a sonnet has 14 lines, okay, 14 lines. The sonnets are very mathematical. You know, this is something we're going to talk a little bit about. So in those 14 lines, you have the first eight lines that are called an octave. So usually what the octave does is it sets out some sort of theoretical or metaphorical problem. You know, usually, of course we'll talk more about Petrarch's themes in a second, but usually it's a problem in terms of themes. So then the last six lines of the sonnet are called the sestet. The sestet is where the poem seeks to resolve the problem that it set out in the first eight lines. So usually in the last six lines of the sonnet, Resolve the they they call it a turn. Usually, like you'll notice the sestet because it'll start with a, a word like a but or something like that. But and then it'll seek to sort of resolve the problem, you know, that and bring an end to the themes that it's talking about. So, whenever Petrarch's translated over into English, then. It ha always has 14 lines. It's first eight, set up a problem. Last six, resolve the problem. As far as Petrarch's themes go, you know, most of his themes were written, most of his poems were written about his love for a married woman who was named Laura. And of course, as far as I was reading up on Petrarch before this, as far as historical records go, Laura was an actual person. So Petrarch kind of spent his life pining away for this woman who he couldn't have. Right? He, he, never, he never really tried. And so oftentimes in his poems then, they take a form of well, Petrarch is oftentimes trying to come closer to God. Well, he, he's, he's trying to come to... He's trying to come to some uh, relationship with sort of that way, but he also has this pining away for this earthy woman named Laura. Those who compare, let's maybe we can compare that to something like Dante's Inferno. Dante talked about Beatrice, right? Beatrice was this sort of perfect woman. Laura, Laura was often dis discussed in this way too, but she wasn't just divine, she was also an earthy woman. Right? And so oftentimes the metaphors that these poems start then is this idea of inaccessible love. The Petrarch loves this woman, he can't ever have her, you know, so what, what's to be done about his feelings for her? So that's the... That's oftentimes the basic, you know, theoretical construct, the thematical, I should say, construct. So, uh, Petrarchan poems in English have a certain rhyme scheme. And they also have a certain meter in English. In English, a sonnet takes the form of what's called iambic pentameter. I've always been bad at explaining iambic pentameter but it's pretty much the beat of a poem, right? I'm, I will actually post another video for you that explains it better than I can. I'm, very, I'm not a poetry person, a tree, but I mean, the pentameter is a beat. So, da 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 It kind of takes a, da, yeah, da 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 an unstressed syllable and a stressed syllable. More on that in another video. What I'm going to discuss for right now is the rhyme schemes. All of these poems have a unique rhyme scheme. Okay, 
So one of the things that I might ask you to do is actually is actually write your own sonnet. You might choose to use Petrar Petrarch's rhyme scheme, or you might choose to do Shakespeare's rhyme scheme. Petrarch's rhyme scheme. So these are the words at the end of the lines. So we have a rhyme scheme of A B B A. So let's what so what we mean by these letters. Like maybe um, you know, whatever word you start with the end of the line, that's that's a sound that we're attributing to the letter A. And then that sound has to be repeated again in the rhyme for the fourth line. So normally when we talk about when we think about rhyme, it's first line, second line, first line, second line. Not with Petrarch. We have this, we have, uh, in the octave, we have A, B, B, A. So we have two rhymes after each other in the second and third lines. The first and fourth lines are supposed to be rhymed. So the octave, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. The, nor the way that it's often translated in English is the sestet, the last six lines, that rhymes whatever sound you put on to the in, in word in those so you start a new you start a new sound a c d and e sound so um, you have another line that ends with the new sound that starts with c you have a new line that starts with the new sound d and then another sound e and then those last three lines where you finally resolve the poem, you have to you repeat those sounds again, but with different words. So it's a little bit of a little bit of a tricky rhyme scheme. You know, if you guys ever try, if you guys try to do one of these yourselves, whenever we do the poem imitation, you guys will see how exactly hard it is to do this. So when we look at the Petrarch, Petrarch poems. I'm going to just, just to keep this video fairly short, I'm going to go over the poems in our collection 141 and 190. So the good thing about this PDF I'm giving you, it actually shows you the English translation. It, the English, the translation for this PDF I'm getting ready to show you, wants to cover accuracy about what the poem says more than preserving the poetic meter. You know, so the so the good thing about that is we're also reading a couple of poems from Sir Thomas Wyatt. Um, more about Sir Thomas Wyatt in just a second. Let's uh, segue over into talking about Petrarch's poems then. Just uh, just a second. Okay, so the two poems I want to talk about, these are, I'm mostly just talking about these two because they're my favorites of the, of the lot. But 141 and 190, okay. So in these poems, we, had, we get a good sort of overview as far as Petrarch's themes about the inaccessible Laura. So let's let's take this first one. I'll read it aloud for you. As sometimes in the summertime, the simple butterfly seeking the light will in its desire fly into someone's eyes whereby it dies in the other's pain. So always I run to my faded son, her eyes whence such sweetness comes to me, for love cares nothing for the reign of reason, and discernment is vanquished by desire. And I see well how much they shun me, and I know truly that I shall die of it, for my strength cannot hold out against the suffering. But so sweetly does love dazzle me that I be well another's pain and not my own harm. My soul blind consents to her own death. So basically, uh, make sure. now basically what this poem is, is doing then is, is, um, uh, you know, the metaphor that's set up 
you know, Sir Ta Petrarch's love for, for Laura is like he has a desire for Laura, right? The desire in this case is compared to the butterfly. The butterfly, the butterfly can't help it, right? It sees this sees this sort of heavenly light and the butterfly's instincts tell the butterfly to fly into the light when oftentimes the light's someone's eyes right so if a butterfly flies into your eyes it's gonna die so his love for her is her radiant light of sorts is like how a butterfly you know the instinct is fly into the light even if it kills it even if it kills it just in this way it's like he compares himself to flying into the sun All right, he can't help it that's his desire he knows there's a lot the third part of that I see well how much they shun me and I know truly that I shall die of it my strength cannot hold out against the suffering so um yeah, kind of, kind of dark, right? You know, he's saying that he can't help this love. He knows it's bad, you know, but he's going to do it anyway, even if it causes him pain. So that's a that's a good sort of that's one of my favorites as far as painting this idea of you know, pining away for someone you can't get. We look over on the other side at the Italian. <clears throat> I can't speak Italian. You know, I'm I'm pretty good with Latin, but Italian, you know, I don't know too well. I can understand some of the words. But what I mostly just want to point out is look at the rhyme scheme. So you have you have sole dole, that's the A and A. Aveza Vageza. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, so forgive me. But that's your B sound. Again, you have the A sound, sole vole. We have the B sound again. That ends with the uh. Dolcesa pressa. Now we have the C D E. So the C sound is meanio. Um Let me see. I kind of lost my train of thought on the rhyme scheme for the end lines. Let's see. Oh, oh, okay. So these these uh, end in the C D C D um, ending from my notes. Yeah, C D C D C D. So we have the Anio, and then um, Afanio, then Don Danio, then we have the the sound that ends with Ente, Ente, Ente. So that's a case where the the sustained ends with a C D C D C D. Now, even though we can't read Italian, you know, uh, you guys can kind of see how the rhyme works. A sounds, B sounds, A sounds, B sounds, C sounds, and then D sounds. Uh, uh, the other one I want to talk about, the reason why I want to talk about this one is because it... Uh, we're going to talk about Sir Thomas Wyatt's translation of it in a second. But this is Sonnet 190 of his collection. So to read this one, A white doe and the green grass appeared to me with two golden horns between two rivers in the shade of a laurel when the sun was rising in the unripe season. Her look was so sweet and proud that to follow her I left every task like the miser who as he seeks treasure sweetens his trouble with the light. Let no one touch me, she bore, written with diamonds and topazes around her lovely neck, 
It has pleased my Caesar to make me free. And the sun had already turned at midday. My eyes were tired by looking but not sated when I fell into the water and she disappeared. So the problem that we have, um, you know, we're, the doe in this case is probably, probably Laura, right? So she appears to him. Again, it, it's just like the butterfly poem, he compares himself to someone whose instinct can't help himself. So he's like a miser who seeks treasure, right? The, the, the desire for money and greed is, is pining away for this doe. is kind of like that. And then we have to let no one touch me. It has pleased my Caesar to make me free. And then she disappears. Right, so the, the doe, the doe belongs to Caesar. Right, she belongs to someone else. So hopefully that, hopefully these two kind of gave everybody a good idea as far as what Petrarch's poems are all about. He's a you read through the rest in a small collection, most of the rest of them, you know, go along the same lines. So, uh, going back to my notes, let's talk about Sir Thomas Wyatt a little bit now. So, Wyatt lived two centuries after Petrarch, 1503 to 42. He lived a pretty short life. You know, but um, Wyatt was part of the court of King Henry VIII. As most of you guys probably know a lot about King Henry VIII as far as his multiple wives, all his divorces, his murdered wives, right? But Henry VIII's court kind of helped give birth to a lot of new advancements in English culture, especially poetry. And there's lots of great poets who were living at this time. But Wyatt, you know, Wyatt you know, was a pioneer in transforming the sonnet form of Petrarch into English, you know, which, um, of course, later other poets would in innovate it further. But he, Pet Wyatt tried to capture Petrarch's form into, into good English. And so he, he he thought to himself, "Hey, we English, our culture isn't up to snuff with the other cultures that use Romance languages. So we're not up to snuff with the French, the Italians, the Spanish." So Wyatt then tried to bring a lot of that culture to England. So interesting. So a lot of times in his, a lot of times then Wyatt translated. Petrarch's poems over for a new audience. So he still captured this sort of pining away for an inaccessible lover. You know, but uh, his poems kind of have an extra edge to them. That's one of the great sort of uh, rumors in history that's never really been confirmed. But it was rumored that, Pet that Wyatt was having an affair with one of King Henry VIII's wives, uh, Anne Boleyn. So um, maybe this gives a little bit of an extra edge to his poems. Wyatt actually was jailed pretty close to the, the end of his life by King Henry VIII. You know, I'm, I'm not up to snuff up to snuff on all the history there, you know, but he actually was put in jail. You know, of course, you guys know that living in King Henry VIII's court was not an easy easy task. Now if we try to segue over into the Wyatt poems, let's see. Again, I'm only going to talk about a couple of these. Just a moment to uh, have it pulled up. I have to use to hunt pulled up here. Yeah, let's just talk about this one since we just talked about the Petrarch. 
So this is the same poem we just read, but it has a little bit of an extra edge to it. Note, note that we have our rhymes going. So we have our A sounds, hind, behind, more, sore, mind. This is, this is wind, but, uh, you know, if you were reading it aloud, you'd say wind. A four, therefore. So that ends our A, B, B, A sounds. And we have doubt. About, vain, plain, then our final e, e, am, and tame. So this is a, b, b, a, a, b, b, a. Let's see. Yeah, see, uh, yeah. I'm stumbling over my words a little bit, but you guys can kind of see the uh, the rhyme scheme happening here, right? You just kind of have to look at the last you know, few, um, have to compare it to how it rhymes with all the other words. But if we look at the, if we look at this, whoso lists the hunt, I know where is a hind. But as for me, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore, I am of them that farthest cometh behind. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, but as she fleeth afore, feigning I follow. I leave off therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. Who list their hunt, I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain. Engraven with diamonds and letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about. Noli me tangeri, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. Then if we look at the um, the note, scroll down a little bit on the handout for you. If we look at the note, the noli me tangeri means touch me not. It is believed that Augustus Caesar had inscribed on the collars of his deer the phrase, No lady me tangere, quia Caesara sum. Touch me not, for I am Caesar's. So there's nothing, there's nothing in this poem about the deer being free like it was in the, um, in the Petrarch poem, right? In this, it's almost like a very dire warning. Right, don't touch me. I belong to Caesars. Or if uh, we can, we want to think outside the box a little bit. Maybe Caesar in this case is King Henry the Eighth. Right, so if he's actually is was pining away for Henry the Eighth's wife, you know, maybe Anne Boleyn is our dear here. Yeah, so um, there's another one in this collection too. The first one. This one is a translation of Petrarch's 140, which is also in our collection. Take a look at that one too. You guys can kind of see the see the difference. But so to resum up this lesson, then. Um, remember Petrarch's poems, what they're about, but mostly remember the form. They all end in this rhyme scheme. Um, I'm pretty sure that the poem we just read ends this way. But, um, and of course, we'll talk more about meter in a second whenever we talk about Shakespeare's. So if you write your own, it has to be 14 lines. And if you follow the Petrarchan model, use one of these two rhyme schemes. But you might choose to use the Shakespearean model, as the Shakespearean model is actually a little easier, as we'll see in a second. So um, hopefully that 
help to walk you through some of these poems a little bit. And the main thing to note about them is they're very mathematical. You know, sonnets have a very sort of be beauty in a sense that they all have a very mathematical precision about them. If you try to write your own, you'll appreciate what you know, these guys did a little more just based on the trying to fit these rhymes. Right? Oftentimes it's not easy to do. You also have to have very exact rhymes. You can't just, you can't have a rhyme that doesn't spell as well as sound similar. That's called a slant rhyme. So hopefully that uh, gave you a little bit more knowledge on Petrarch and Wyatt. Until the next video on the Shakespearean sonnet.